Hey, my name is Gavin Bishop. I spent the last two years tutoring both the Hubs 191 and Hubs 192 papers every week out in the college. And over that time, the other Hubs tutor and I would run crash course tutorials uh, before progress tests and end of semester exams. And I've always wanted to create a bit more of a permanent resource out of those crash course tutorials. In this video, we'll be revising the nine key areas that from my experience, people tend to trip up on out of the first 12 lectures of Hubs 191. For each of those nine key areas, we're gonna first explain the concept simply, secondly, go over some of the key details that you need to remember, and then thirdly, go over a memorization trick that you can use to memorize those key details so you don't forget them for the test. Uh, this should be useful for those who are revising for the upcoming Hubs 191 progress test. Uh, this is the first progress test that you run into when you do HealthSci, as well as people revising for the end of semester exam, as well as anyone who's interested in what people learn during Health Sciences first year. Uh, this is far from a comprehensive tutorial. Uh, there's plenty of examinable content that I miss out on. Uh, there'll be timestamps down below. Concept number one, you have lots of bones in your body and wherever these bones connect is called a joint. And you have different types of joints in your body in order to serve different functions. The main trade-off is between stability and mobility. So how much you can move versus how much it doesn't move when you don't want it to. Now, there are three overall major types of joints which go in order of stability versus mobility. So the most stable are the fibrous joints then the cartilaginous joints are in the middle, and then synovial joints at the end are the most mobile, but the least stable compared to the previous two. Now, there are seven subtypes of those synovial joints. This is one of the first big lists that you encounter when you do um, Hubs 191 and even in HealthSci. It's a classic example of needing to memorize a set of concepts. Now, I want to really encourage you when you have to memorize these set of concepts, you want to turn it from a set into an enumeration. Now an enumeration is a fancy word for just a list of things that can only go in that one order. It's always in a set logical sequence and that's the way you remember it. So for the seven synovial joint types, I recommend Harry Potter shouldn't even consider playing basketball. Now this is a really convenient enumeration of course. The Harry and Potter, otherwise known as hinge and pivot, um, cover both the uniaxial joints, whereas the shouldn't even consider saddle, ellipsoid, and condylar cover biaxial joints, whereas the Final, um, playing basketball, covers the multi-axial joints of the ball and socket and the plane joints. So that has that really easy in order for you to go and remember. If they're all out of order, that would make it much more difficult. Moving on to concept number two, bones aren't just there to make up your skeleton, they do a bunch of different things. The list you have to remember is they make blood cells, they provide support, they help with movement, they help with protection, and they help with storage of things like calcium and other ions. The way I remember this fact about bones is that politicians will lie about their skeletons in their closet, otherwise known as bullshit MPs or BS MPS. Blood cells, support, movement, protection, and storage. Some other bone things you have to remember, might not be so intuitive, is for instance, the number of vertebrae in the vertebral column. Uh, so you have your cervical vertebrae, then your thoracic vertebrae, then your lumbar vertebrae. Uh, the way that we always were taught to remember this is that uh, when you're in the hall, you have breakfast at seven, lunch at 12, and dinner at five. Similarly, another confusion can be between carpals and tarsals. Now you can remember that uh, the carpals are in your hand, so when you pull a steering wheel, you pull a car, that's the carpals. Whereas on your feet, the tarsals are by like the pavement or the tar, so that's the tarsals. Uh, the other confusion is that there are eight carpals and seven tarsals. So the way I remember which way around those are, is that when one car pulls another, there's eight wheels there. So that's eight carpals. Concept number three is the Human Tissue Act. Now this is not a complicated topic, but a lot of people tend to trip up on it. Uh, I assume because it's in the first lecture and they assume it's not relevant directly to anatomy and physiology. They almost always put in a question about this in the end of your exam, so you should definitely know the four things about the Human Tissue Act of 2008. Firstly, bodies come from bequests, uh, they're not from criminals um, or unclaimed people. Uh, secondly, uh, they have to give informed consent when they're alive. Thirdly, an immediate family member must give consent uh, after their death, so if they disagree, even if the person originally gave consent, then it's overruled. Finally, most are held for 18 months, but it can be further for research and teaching. Um, there's no like simple trick I have to remember this, but I think if you just think of someone asking you to explain, you know, how is it that cadavers come into the anatomy school? If you can explain the different points and the different checks that they have, uh, that'll get you a long way in the exam. Moving on to number four, bone is a living tissue just like every other part of your body, and it has cells and bits outside of the cells called the extracellular component. Um, the extracellular component is one third organic, and two thirds inorganic. The inorganic component is mostly hydroxyapatite, which is a mineral salt, which gives bone its characteristic hardness. Um, and the organic component is mostly the collagen fibers embedded in a proteoglycan matrix. 
Now, an easy confusion to make is proteoglycans and glycoproteins, uh, because one is proteins with sugar all over it, and the other one is sugar with protein all over it. Now, the way you remember which one's which with these two words is thinking of a tiger shark. Now, a tiger shark is mostly shark with only a little bit of tiger. Therefore, proteoglycan is mostly glycan or sugar, which is a little bit of protein. In terms of the cellular component, which only makes up 2% of the overall bone, uh, there's three main cells you need to know about, the osteoblasts, the osteoclasts, and the osteocytes. The way you remember these three different types of bone cells is that osteoblasts blast down and create new bone matrix, whereas osteoclasts break it down, because class makes me break down, and osteocytes uh, are the ones that are on site, they stay in one place, they're trapped in those lakes, the lacunae. Concept number six is that joints can move in different directions, and we have different names for those. Key ones to remember are abduction and adduction. Remember, adduction is adding to your side, whereas abduction is abducting away um, your arm or, or whatever limb is going. Uh, the other one is the pro basketballer is in pronation, whereas the soup carrier is in supination. And a key difference to remember with those is that they're not actually having rotation at the elbow, you're having it at the radial ulnar joint. Another easy area to confuse is the radius and the ulna, so just remember that in the anatomical position, rum. That's radius, ulna, middle, which makes rum. Constant number seven, a big one, is cross bridge cycling. So this just means that inside your muscles, there's a bunch of little proteins that move around when calcium goes in, and this creates tension and causes the whole muscle to shorten, and this is what makes your muscles move places. Now, I could explain the whole thing, but I think it's best done by Hank Green, actually, so I'll just link up his crash course video. With this and many other physiology things, you don't want to try to memorize the parts discreetly. Instead, you want to have like an idea of how everything flows into the next part, uh, sort of like an enumeration, uh, but with real life uh, concepts. Concept number eight is that in order for the muscles to know that they need to do their shortening, you need to send an electrical signal down to the muscle um, to tell it to release calcium. So all of the muscle cell shortening happens because calcium gets released into the water inside the cell or the cytoplasm. And where it is beforehand is in little bags inside the cytoplasm called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a fancy name for the endoplasmic reticulum, but because it's in the muscle, they call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, um, the way you tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that calcium is you have to send an electrical signal down there. Uh, and you learn much more about the details of action potentials when you get to the neuro module, um, but just for now know that it's an electrical signal. So you know this electrical signal travels around the outside of the cell, but how does it get to these little organelles, these little pockets inside of the cell? It gets that by traveling along the outside and then going into these pockets called T-tubules. From there, there's three main things you need to know about. First, there's a voltage sensor that senses the electrical signal coming down. Secondly, there's a gate, which somehow talks to that voltage sensor and then lets all the calcium out of that sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then thirdly, there's a pump, which puts the calcium back in at the end of it all. It works slightly different for cardiac and smooth muscle, but you guys don't need to know about that. Um, just know that the other types of muscle exist. Just like with any other physiology concept, I recommend putting it all graphically on a piece of paper as a visual representation for what you want to understand. And then after that, and then once you understand everything in the concept, it's best to predict memory confusion. So predict what might be confusing to you in the future after you've had a few nights sleep or in a few weeks time. So for me, I knew I definitely might get confused between the voltage gate called DHPR and the uh, calcium gate, which is called RYR or ryanidine receptor. And also the pump, which puts it all back in uh, called Circa. So these are three different letter-based names, which don't really make any intuitive sense to me, and I can definitely predict myself confusing which one for the other. So for this, you want to predict this and then make up some kind of rule for yourself or justification so that if you do get it wrong, you can easily check. Uh, in this situation, you want the R next to the R in your diagram in your head. So DHPR then goes next to the ryanidine receptor, RYR. If you had it the other way around, it would be RYR and then it went to D, and that would make that would kind of trigger something in your brain and you'd be like, oh man, the R's don't, aren't next to each other, something's wrong, it has to be the other way around. Uh, so a simple checking solution that you can't mix it up with uh, is really good for these sort of things. Another simple one is that you know that the calcium pump is an ATPase because uh, it goes against the concentration gradient, therefore it has to get rid of ATP, so therefore it ends in A. So therefore, Circa is the only thing that has A in it, so therefore it has to be that one. Concept number nine is the gait cycle. When we walk, 
each of the joints goes through a different repetition of different movements that helps you do that very specialized movement of walking overall. When it comes to the gait cycle, you really want to make sure you don't get confused between the position the joint is in and what the muscles are doing at that time. So for instance, when your heel just hits the ground as uh, at the beginning of your step, uh, your hip will be in flexion, it will be quite far forward, but all of the muscles of the hip will be extending because they're pulling backwards at the time. Just because the muscles are extending doesn't mean the hip isn't in flexion. I really recommend walking around and thinking about each joint one at a time and what position that joint is in as well as what the muscles are doing at any given point. Then taking all of this information and putting it into a table like this one. And then you can test yourself on the different parts of the table in order to have an active recall form of memorization. Just quickly, one area of confusion that comes up all the time in tutoring is that how the hamstrings can be concentrically contracting from mid stance into late stance, even though the knee is going from flexion to extension. If that confuses you, don't worry about it. Um, you can just memorize it. Uh, but if you are trying to figure out uh, why that is the case, uh, try to visualize a runner, instead of pushing off the ground all the time, they're going forward, grabbing and pulling the ground towards them. Uh, that's kind of the action that the hamstring is performing. As well as remember that the hamstring connects to the hips, so the hamstring performing concentric action is also extending the hip, uh, as well as flexing the knee joint. All right, that concludes the nine quick tips. If you're wondering about tests, just remember with HealthSci, if it's not in the slides, you don't need to worry about it. But if you do have questions, you can ask your tutors during tutorial time or your lab demonstrators during lab time. Um, or if you go to past tutorials, they're brilliant as well. I do recommend getting hold of some kind of God files, some kind of past answer banks or notes that can be really useful. Um, I'll link some of the notes that I use in this video down below. Uh, shout out to Otis for his beautiful drawings. The way I've structured this video isn't how I organize my notes, nor is it how I recommend you should. It was just for teaching purposes. Um, I am actually working on a video about how to design a study system at the moment, um, and I'll film and upload that in the next few weeks, hopefully. If any of this video was helpful or interesting to you, uh, please click subscribe. It's really motivating and uh, supports the channel. Um, all the best with exams, and I hope you have a great day.